friends, welcome to Centennial United Methodist Church at the St. Anthony Park campus. Glad to have you. We're transitioning today from our series with Peter into a series about forgiveness. And uh, the last several weeks, the sermon titles have actually been lyrics from the song, Come Thou Fount. And so to bookend this, uh, let's start there. Won't you please stand and sing with us? Upon it, 
Drifting off, my heart was failing. Yeah, my heart was failing in the dark. Put a song. Feeling good this morning? It's good to be in worship with y'all. Let's change the tempos, moods a little bit. You 
give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart. Regardless of how we find ourselves, and no matter how we find ourselves. Thank you for the gift of this community. Thank you for the gift of the journey that we are all on. God, continue to lead us, guide us, and show us how you would have us interact with this world. In the name of your grace, in the name of your love, in the name of your restoration. It's in your name we pray. Would you please be seated?
ಸಂಗೀತ ಕೋರ್ಸಿಗೆ ಬರ್ತೀನಿ ಅಂತ ಹೇಳಿ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಬಂದು ನಿಜ ಆಗಿ ಕೇಳಿಸಿದ್ರು ಅವಾಗ ನಾನು ಹೋದಾಗ ನಿಮ್ಮ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ನಾನು ಒಂದು ಪಾಠದ ಇದಾಗ ಇದನ್ನು ಒಪ್ಪಿಸ್ತೀನಿ ಅಂತ ಸಂಗೀತದಲ್ಲಿ ಒಪ್ಪಿಸ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೆ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಅನ್ ವಾಯ್ಸ್ ಕೂಡ ಎಷ್ಟೊಂದು ಚೆಂದ ಇರುತ್ತೆ ಅಷ್ಟು ವಾಯ್ಸ್ ಕೊಡ್ತೀನಿ pastor so it's just a fun journey to be on and to learn and, and live in Christ with Whitney uh, next week flames are coming so uh, we've wanted them to come join us for a long time they have some people that need some assistance getting up our stairs and now that we have our lift they can come so join us next Sunday they're gonna help us lead worship they're gonna do they have a cool little puppet show that they do they're gonna do that for us so join us come welcome them uh, to SAP now that we have a safe way to get them into our sanctuary if you're new to Centennial, you want to learn more about us, uh, join Pastor Whitney up here after service, and you guys will head off to lunch at a local restaurant to chat about Centennial and discover Centennial. I think with that, I need the kids' help today. It's noisy offering day. Can I get help from my friends? All right, and while the kids are doing noisy offering, please uh, stand up, greet each other, and share the sign of peace. More. I don't know about you all, but I love seeing the kids participating in worship gathering together. Um, I kind of tapped Whitney and said, hey, Whitney, can, can you help the kiddos? But like, they've got it. They are leading worship. They know what they're doing. It is fantastic. If we want to, kids, uh, you can head on off to Faith Walk, off to the side here for our fifth graders and below. If it's uh, better for your family to have your kids in worship with us, we would, we would love to have your kids in worship with us as well. Kids will be downstairs for a faith walk, though, and uh, families, if you would be so kind as to make your way down quickly. I know it's great to chit-chat, but our volunteers like to clean up and get moving along as well, too, for all the things. So if you can pick your kiddos up, that's very helpful to our volunteers. Would you all join me in prayer? Gracious and holy God, come and be present with us this day. Open our hearts, our eyes, our minds, our ears, that we might hear your word for each of us this morning. 
Amen. Throughout Lent and Easter, we've been using a series called A Wandering Heart, Figuring Out Faith with Peter. It's from uh, the Sanctified Art series. Um, We took a pause last week for holy humor, and now we're kind of finishing up our Wandering Heart series. And today's going to be sort of this bridge. We're closing out Wandering Heart, and we're kind of bridging our way over into our forgiveness series. And we forgot to mention it during the announcements. You even asked me if there was another thing. Um, The series imagery for the forgiveness series was made by a youth uh, with charcoal and, I think, acrylic paint. And it is breathtaking. Uh, So AJ Tong did that for us. He is incredibly talented, and we thank him profusely for sharing his gifts in that way. You'll get to see it soon, I promise. But we have been paying attention to Peter for many weeks now. He is one of the disciples, and he has a roller coaster journey of faith. I'm sure many of us can relate as well. We've gotten to walk with Peter, to wander around his faith as well. So we have watched as he put aside what he knew, this life of fishing, in order to follow Jesus. We got to be there as he took a step of faith, stepping out of the boat onto the water and walking towards Christ. We got to listen in as he professed his faith in Jesus as the Messiah. He was named the rock on which Jesus would build his church. But he was also rebuked by Jesus. Jesus directed his words directly at Peter when Jesus said, Get behind me, Satan. And yet still, Jesus humbly takes the role of a servant, kneeling down and washing the feet of the disciples, including Peter. Later on, Peter denies even knowing Jesus three times before Jesus' death. And then on Easter morning, When the disciples are gathered together and they hear the words of the women after they've come from the tomb, saying, he's not there, he is risen. Even though some of the disciples hear these words from the women as garbage, as Whitney pointed out, Peter takes off. He goes running to get to the tomb to see for himself that Jesus is not there. So we've got to wander with Peter. And we've seen his relationship with Christ, this trust with Jesus, build and build and take some different turns along the way. It has not been all wonderful and glorious and easy, for sure. The authors of the Wandering Heart series write that in Peter, we get to see a person who is both steadfast and steady, a person who is a dear friend and also a betrayer, a follower and a wanderer. In Peter, we get to catch a glimpse of ourselves. And by following Peter's journey, we get to watch a story of Jesus unfold through the eyes of a very normal human being who is just trying to figure out faith, just like each and every one of us. So we're going to jump into today's scripture where we get to come kind of full circle with Peter. Let's read together. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, have you no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the nets to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, And now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, 
and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And though they were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. I'm going to guess that if you're here, if you're watching online, you have at least caught a glimmer, a glimpse of what it's like to have God fully present in your life. Maybe you have even felt called to follow God in a very specific kind of way. Now, it may not be a call into pastoral ministry. Maybe it is. If it is, I'd love to have a conversation with you. <laughs> but for sure, there are many of you who have been called by God to follow in a certain way. Because we have seen it. And I want you to remember for a moment. Remember what it was like to experience God more fully present with you, where you had no shadow of a doubt that it was God calling you, inviting you, leading you to take a step of faith. Now, often we kind of, I think, glorify these moments a little bit, right? These mountaintop experiences, and they are something. They are awe-inspiring and breathtaking, to be sure. But that's not all they are. They are also terrifying. When God calls you, it is nerve-wracking. I have yet to meet anyone who has felt called by God and immediately felt like, well, for sure, I got this handled, right? Right? When God calls you into something, there is usually hesitation that comes with it. Because we don't know exactly what that's going to look like or mean for our lives. There's a disruption in there as well. And the disciples get this. They have been in intense encounters with the risen Christ. But they have been left a little bit dazed and thrown off balance because they're not quite sure what it means for them going forward. And like many of us do, 
when we are presented with the unknown, we like to go back to what's comfortable, right? Not just me. <laughs> we want to go to what's familiar, what we know. We want to turn away from that unknown, terrifying thing. On Easter morning, the disciples lock themselves behind closed doors because they are unsure what this means for their life. On this day, in our scripture, Peter wants to do that same thing. I imagine him sitting around with all of the disciples, not knowing what exactly to do next. And so he tosses out, I'm going to go fishing, right? Back, back to what he knows, what he is comfortable with. And I imagine that all the disciples kind of look around at one another and like nobody else has a really good idea for what next. So they say, yeah, sure, I'm in, let's go. They throw that gone fishing sign on the door and they head out to something comfortable, something normal, something they know how to do. But then, then they pull in their nets and all they have is seaweed and trash. And I wonder how far their hearts sank because even what they knew isn't working anymore. Of course, they knew that this could happen, right? If you have been out fishing, you know that you're not guaranteed to catch fish every time. But I wonder, I imagine, right, because I've done this myself, after you encounter Christ, after you have that moment with Jesus. And they have seen the risen Lord a couple of times now, right? It's not just walking with Christ before the resurrection. This is seeing the resurrected Christ. I imagine that after that experience, they're like a little bit hopeful that maybe things are going to turn out right. Yeah? That maybe it's not too much to ask if they go fishing that like maybe it would work well and maybe like extremely well but they get nothing. Whatever they had hoped or expected, their nets are empty, and the very next morning, they wake up, and there's somebody on the shore out there who's, like, calling to them, and it, and it kind of sounds like he's mocking them, right? Hey, kids, you don't have any fish, do you? It feels like this absurd moment with Jesus, and it calls to mind that memory, that story of when Peter stepped out of the boat in the midst of a storm, and he heads toward Jesus, and then he looks around, and he feels the waves on his ankles, on his calves, and he begins to sink. And Jesus has this moment where we're not really sure if he's mocking or being gracious or something in the middle Jesus says, why did you doubt, O oh, you of little faith? It feels absurd. Maybe, though, Jesus wasn't mocking. Maybe it was more serious or playful or an honest question. You don't have any fish, do you? Jesus is cooking Maybe he's inviting the disciples to bring what they have. Whatever it is, the disciples answer in all honesty, we don't have any fish. We have nothing. And they hear Jesus' instruction to toss the nets on the other side of the boat, and they can't be too disheartened because they go ahead and they do it. They toss out the nets, and soon they are overflowing with fish, so much that they can hardly pull in these nets because the weight is so great. And that is the moment it happens. This person who's standing out there, they immediately recognize in the abundance before them as Jesus. 
And I love what Peter does next. In this translation, it says he puts on some clothes because he was naked. In other translation, it says he puts on like an outer garment. Whatever it was, his immediate reaction is to get ready and to go. He jumps out of the boat. It says they were like 100 yards off, and he could not wait until the boat got to shore. He had to get to Jesus as fast as he could. So he hightails it out of the boat. I can like feel his adrenaline and his excitement like pumping through my body when I read this scripture. He had to get there as fast as he could. And then. And then I can see him coming out of the water, trudging those last few steps up the shore and seeing Jesus standing by a fire, by a charcoal fire. Imagine what Peter is imagining. Imagine your very worst day. Not just a day that like things didn't go well, but a day where you really messed up. A day where your values, your beliefs were tested and you could not stand up to the standards you thought you held. And Peter didn't just do this once or twice, but three times. When Peter rushes out of the boat to meet Jesus, he is eager and enthusiastic. He is on like the highest of highs. And I imagine everything comes plummeting down when he steps out of the water, clothes dripping wet, trudging up those last couple of steps on the sand toward Jesus. I imagine that his heart stopped when he saw that fire and the memory it brought back. And I wonder if it didn't cross his mind for just a sliver of a second to like hightail it back to the boat and to go back to what he knew and to forget all of this because it was too hard. So at some point as he is walking towards Jesus, he has to see that fire. And I wonder how difficult it was to keep putting one foot in front of the other, walking towards Jesus, towards the person you denied and betrayed, the person you hurt the most. Because the only other time in the Gospels where we hear about a charcoal fire is where Jesus denies Jesus by that charcoal fire. He is approached three times, asked again and again and again, weren't you one of the disciples? He says, no, that's not me. No, f- but for real, I think, I think I saw you with Jesus, right? Aren't you one of them? He says, no, no, it's not me. That's not me. And then it somehow gets even more personal. Because one of the slaves of the high priest, who's a relative of the man whose ear Peter cut off, is standing at the fire, and he says, no, I I think I saw you in the garden. Weren't you the one? Wasn't it you? And Peter says, no, that's not me. And immediately after he says no, that third time, the cock crows just as Jesus had predicted. If you've ever been like tossed into a pool with clothes on and then you get out, you know that sopping wet clothes are not a light weight to carry. But I imagine they are nothing compared to the weight that Peter carries with him walking towards Jesus on that shore. And then Peter being Peter, right, the eager, enthusiastic one who's going to go and prove himself time and time again, He turns around and he goes and he grabs this net full of fish, 153 of them, mind you, 
that all of the disciples in the boat like struggled to pull in, Peter single-handedly pulls it ashore. And it's almost as if he is desperately trying to prove to Jesus, hey, look, I can do something. I can be useful, right? Don't remember that. I can do better. I can be an agent for good and not evil. And Jesus does not specifically bring up the fire or what happened. But I can't imagine that it's not there for a purpose. And Jesus gathers his disciples around this fire, this symbol. And he cooks up some fish and some bread and he gathers his friends with him. And he shares a meal together. He takes the food and he breaks it. And he gives it out to each of his disciples. And beside that charcoal fire, where Peter was once questioned three times and denied knowing Jesus three times, Jesus turns things around and questions Peter three times again. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Simon, do you love me? Do you love me? And twice Peter responds with, Lord, you know that I love you. But after being questioned that third time, Peter's overcome with distress. Lord, you know everything. Of course you know that I love you. And after each question and response, Peter or Jesus instructs Peter to go to feed my sheep, to tend my flock, to feed my sheep. The last time that Peter was in this place beside a charcoal fire answering three separate questions, he failed miserably. But this time, with Jesus, the risen Lord, present with him, being nourished by the gifts, by the graces of God, Jesus asks Peter three times again, and Peter responds with words of affirmation. this time when he is given that nourishment, that ritual feast that Jesus hands to his disciples again and again and again and to us again and again and again. Jesus walks with Peter through the very worst of his past and he ushers him in to a brand new future. Peter has made mistakes he has gotten it wrong time and time again. He has let himself down. He has let others down. And yet Jesus offers nourishment. Jesus offers forgiveness. Jesus offers grace again and again and again. He continues to call Peter to do this work, to tend to the flock, to feed the sheep, reminding Peter that you are called to this work and you are strengthened to do this work. Through Jesus' presence, even with the deepest scars of our own past, we are offered healing and forgiveness and new life breaks forth with Christ. May it be so for Peter and for us, today and always. Amen. Now we're going to enter our time of giving. Uh, we all have plates passed around you. There should be a Q or text to give behind me here in a moment in the QR code. Uh, we believe that giving is part of what it means to follow Jesus. So please give and give joyfully.
as the ushers continue to pass the plates among you, I would call your attention up here to this table where we gather every single Sunday here at the St. Anthony Park campus because the reminder is important, amen? The reminder that no matter how many times we mess up, no matter how many times we are a part of the hurt that exists in the world, we are still welcome to this table to be nourished, to be met by Jesus, and the permission to try again and again and again. So we gather here and we remember Jesus and how on the night when he was to be betrayed, he gathered with his disciples, his best friends. In the middle of supper, he took a loaf of bread he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body. This is my whole self given for you. Every time you eat of this bread, he said, remember that and remember me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and he blessed it, and he gave it to his disciples and invited them to simply drink, receive, saying this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you, for many, for all, for the forgiveness of sin. Every time you drink of this cup, he said, remember that. Remember me. Let's pray. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on all that are gathered here in person or online. Fall afresh on all the people and names and places that are especially on our hearts today in prayer. We pray for the family of Joyce Fletcher, longtime centennial member who passed away last Sunday and whose family will be celebrating her life this Tuesday. For all those that have experienced loss in our community, we pray for our world and for all the places that are soaked in war and in violence, oh God, bring your grace and your forgiveness and your peace. May that spirit who companions us through our entire lives, through the best of us and the worst of us, the spirit of the living God fall afresh on these simple gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we may be for the world, the body of Christ, that is set free, forgiven, and loved by your love and sacrifice for us. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray our Lord's Prayer. And so we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Family of faith, these are the gifts of God. For you, for me, for us, for all, for the people of God. I would invite the communion servers to come forward, and as they prepare to serve you, I would remind you that no matter who you are, what you've done, where you come from, or what has been done to you, you are welcome here. So come and eat. There will be gluten-free bread right here in the middle if you need. of water, earth, and sky. The heavens are your tabernacle. 
glory to the Lord on high. God who wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy. The universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy, Lord of heaven and earth, Lord of heaven and earth. Early in the morning, I will celebrate the light when I stumble in the darkness. I will call your name by night, God who wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy. Universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy, Lord of heaven and earth. Lord of heaven and earth. Hallelujah to the Lord. Hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth. Hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and God wonders beyond our galaxy. Oh, you are holy, holy. The universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy. Lord. stand and sing with us one more time. Yeah. 
faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You have done great things. God, you do great things. the forgiveness of God goes with you always and you are called to follow and to love God with your whole self this day and always. Amen. Amen.